Good afternoon, everyone. Another nice, calm day at sea. Oh, I've been directed to move the furniture. There. All right, now that I've finished my moving operation, anyway, I'd like to welcome you to this presentation. It's another one that now we're going to focus back on uh, the places that we're visiting during the cruise. Uh, my name is still Don Campbell, and I'm still pretty darn happy. Uh, today we're going to focus on the origin of the Caribbean islands, or if you prefer, Caribbean islands, depending on where you come from. But I'm going to call them the Caribbean islands and its people, as well as uh, we're going to visit Martinique. All right, here we go. Now, this is a view of the Caribbean islands from space. There are over 40 entities that hold political dominion over the various hundred size, uh, different islands in the Caribbean, and they range in size from the largest, Cuba, that's the one circled in red at nearly 43,000 square miles, to the smallest, Little Cayman. You can't even see it in this picture, uh, but I put a circle so you kind of know where it is. That's less than 10 square miles. To kind of put it into context, Cuba's population is 12 million people. Uh, Little Cayman's is about 190. So it kind of tells you the difference between the two countries. Now there's also a lot of, uh, I'll call them rocks, unpopulated islands that are just a few hundred yards or less across. Now the Caribbean plate, which is that big round thing there, uh, is one of the tectonic segments that make up the Earth's crust. Plate tectonics, uh, from the Greek tecton, that means builder or mason, is a geologic term that describes the large-scale motions of the Earth's crust. And many of the Caribbean islands are created by tectonic movement of those plates. But there's also several other ways that the islands take form. Now, as I said in the Out of Africa talk, a subduction zone occurs when two plates collide and one rides up over the other. When the top plate is forced upward, it creates new land uh, from the old seafloor, particularly if the thing started out underwater. And in this case, the primary rock formations are most likely limestone and dolomite. In another instance, the oceanic crust is pushed down, and friction and heat from the Earth's core cause that plate to melt, and that results in uh, volcanoes, and lava spews forth from those volcanoes and forms an island. Uh, basically, the primary rock formations there will be lava and basalt. Uh, pummeling wind and rain and pounding waves cause some of the volcanic rock to fracture, to break down and make soils and clay and sand. Now, another way that islands are formed or enlarged is through coral growth. Coral builds up in shallow water near continental shores, uh, and a lot of times on newly formed volcanic cones. In waters that are very rich with nutrients, corals rapidly take hold and thrive. Over 9% of the world's coral reefs exist in the Caribbean. They're found in shallow water, usually has to be pretty clear marine water. Uh, these tropical reefs are among nature's most diverse ecosystems. They're composed of many species of fish, plants, invertebrates, and microorganisms. Many reefs are threatened by both natural and man-made dangers, including, among other things, warming of the seas. Very colorful in life, corals become this ghostly white when they're ble uh, bleach formations after they die. Uh, these important reef builders secrete this calcium carbonate. That's all that's left after they die. That forms a hard skeleton that breaks up in a crashing surf, and that's where the white and really light-colored sands come from. Coral reefs control erosion along the shorelines. They also serve as a pretty good source of income and food for the local people. Now, once islands are formed, climate starts to take over as a very important factor. Generally, on the windward side of an island, there will be greater rainfall. And that's simply because the prevailing wind brings moisture from out on the, over the sea up over the land. And that rain is generated because even though it's not very high, that air gets pushed up, and as it gets pushed up, it gets just a little bit cooler, and as it gets cooler, it condenses into water and drops out of the sky. Anyway, the windward side of an island is generally much greener and more densely covered with plant life. Martinique, Grenada, and Barbados are all examples of windward islands. They generally receive the moisture carrying storms that come in from the southeast. The island's leeward side is away from the prevailing wind, 
so the land there is much drier and more barren. Some very low islands are not capable of generating significant amounts of rain. Those are islands where they can't push those clouds up very much at all. And there, there may be near desert conditions. Succulents and cacti are the most predominant plant life. Guadeloupe is an example of a lured island. It lies north in the northeast part of the Caribbean. And islands to the southeast, <laughs> they simply don't want to share their rain. Now, the plants arrive on natural rafts of drifting material. Some of you saw a lot of seaweed drifting out here in the Sargasso Sea. That's kind of the way some plants get to islands. Uh, and it's carried by sea currents. Then there's also hurricanes that are very common in the Caribbean. And those very high winds can carry plant material hundreds of miles. Uh, they often reach, uh, other plants will reach the island as pods or as seeds uh, that float on the water. And also sea and migratory birds carry plants and seeds in their gut and in their feathers, and those are dropped on a new island. The most prominent plant on many of the Caribbean islands is the Turk's cap. This cactus is distinguished by this little fez-like cap-shaped flower cluster on the top. It's found in abundance on the lured islands. I should caution you, though, when you're out walking along in some of the parks and, and botanical areas in these places, be really careful because they'll be right alongside of the path. And if you brush against them, you're going to know it right away because those spines are not plastic like the ones you see in the stores. The century plant is another plant to watch out for on the Leeward Islands. It originally came from Mexico and Central America, and it was brought to the islands primarily by storm conditions. And although it's called a century plant, it typically only lives uh, maybe 10 to 30 years. It generally doesn't live a whole lot longer than that. It spreads about 10 feet, maybe 3 meters or so. It has these gray-green leaves uh, that are up to 5 feet long or 1.5 meters. Uh, and each of those has a very prickly edge, if you will, along it and a very heavy spike right up on the end of it that could, if you got stabbed with it, go all the way to the bone. Now, near the end of its life, it could be 10 years, 30 years, but near the time when this plant is going to die, it sends up a very tall branch stalk that will be covered with yellow flowers. And I'm sure you've seen these, or you will see them when we're in the Caribbean. Whether they have flowers or not, I don't know, but you will see some of them with the stalk standing up. That stalk could be as high as 9 meters or about 30 feet high. You could also look for the bird of paradise along the journey. It's an indigenous in most of the Caribbean islands, and, but it's most plentiful over on the Windward Islands where they get more rain. These are actually members of the banana family, and that means they're also related to the cannas and the gingers, and they come in a wide variety of shapes and colors. And on the various islands in the Caribbean, you will see a lot of those different colors. Trees of many kinds are found in the Caribbean. Uh, the most common, of course, are palms. And they are very uniquely suited to strong prevailing winds because instead of having strong, hard limbs, they have the palm fronds that basically act like a big wind sock when the storms come through. Uh, they also like the relatively poor soil that's found along the beaches. Uh, you may see some shrubs and hardwoods and a few coniferous trees in the islands, but few of the islands have large old-growth forests. Uh, that's because most of the trees were cut down basically right after the Europeans got here to make room for sugar plantations. The first visitors to the new islands are often birds. Now here we can meet the bird again. He's a little different colored than the one I showed before, but he appears to be walking on the water. And some of you may remember that we talked about the Hakana when we were over in Africa. It's also known as the Jesus bird or the lily trotter. And they're identified by their really, really huge feet and claws. And that enables them to walk on the vegetation and, and shallow lakes and along the shore. And they have very sharp beaks and rounded wings. And of course, they hunt for grubs and bugs in the water. We know the prominent Calibri on Martinique as a hummingbird. It's a lot smaller than this. It's probably not much bigger than the hummingbirds you're all familiar with. These tiny birds really started out, migrated to nearly all of the Americas, and they can be found from Alaska all the way to Tierra del Fuego at the end of South America. 
The hummingbirds are believed to have originated in South America, most probably in the Andes Mountains of Peru. From there, they traveled over to the Orinoco River in Venezuela, and then they came up into the Caribbean. They went other places too, but the ones we're talking about came that way. Uh, and that kind of indicates that they may have come north with the very first people. Catch a ride on a canoe, if you will. Now this is the migration pattern of the early Caribbean people. And they named the islands that they inhabited based on what they experienced on those islands. Now I find it very interesting, a lot of people think I'm a little weird, but uh, I find it very interesting that the only island that has its original name still today is Tobago. All the rest of them have different names. Now can you guess which one of those islands is Martinique? Anybody? Okay, well, <laughs> if you ask your travel agent to book a, a trip to Mandanina, <laughs> odds are they're going to look at you like, what? Anyway, that's what it used to be called, but today it's called Martinique. So let's take a little trip over there. The Caribbean islands were populated by three tribes, the Chibini, the Arawak, and the Carib. That started about 6,000 years ago. Now, the Chibini people were first, and they were a pre-ceramic culture. In other words, they didn't have pots and things like that. Uh, while they lived a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, they had a very poorly developed social structure. It's believed that the Chibini were relatively peaceful people. Uh, they were wiped out by the tribes that followed them. The Arawak migrated into the Caribbean from Venezuela. That was around 2,000 years after the Chibini. And you may hear of the Arawak in this part of the world referred to as the Taino. They lived in villages that were built around ceremonial ball courts, and there they would play a game much similar to today's soccer. Their social structure was headed by a tribal chieftain who led the community and who also had significant power. By about 600 AD, the Arawak had moved up through the Lesser Antilles to Puerto Rico. They moved onto the island of Hispaniola. Countries there today are known as Haiti and Dominican Republic. Arawak tribes left behind artifacts dating back to 4000 BC, but that was only on the island of Cuba and Hispaniola. The Arawak lived in kingdoms that were all based on their religious beliefs. Uh, they had gods that were called zemis. This is a few of them to give you an idea what they look like. The natives made offerings to their zemis for protection from disease and natural disasters. Sometime around 4,000 years ago, the zemis changed from being made solely from stone. Now they added other things, stones, bones, shells, and even human remains. Uh, later, figures of gods or zemis appeared to have fabric and clay included. The Europeans believed that the Arawak were savages, but that didn't stop them from profitably trying to use the natives as slaves. Christopher Columbus considered the Arawak to be perfect workers. They were quick learners, and they were accustomed to the hot, humid climate. Now, the Arawak people were short, olive-skinned people who bound their infants' foreheads to shape it into a point, kind of like mine. Mine's not pointed? No. Okay. Uh, they considered this, along with the use of black and white body paint, to be attractive. Chiefs and influential members of the tribe wore nose plugs and rings in their ears that were made of copper and gold alloys. The Spaniards didn't bring any women with them when they came the, uh, with the first expeditions, but they took Arawak women for common law wives and that resulted in what the Spanish called the Mestizo children. The Carib were a tropical forest people who also originated in South America. Now these people were more hostile in nature than the Arawak, and they basically wiped out the Arawak as they moved north and took their women as brides. As a result, the children for the Caribs were very often raised along Arawak cultural lines. Uh, the Carib lived in small frame houses that surrounded an outdoor fireplace, central fireplace, and that's where their ceremonies would take place. They were very accurate bowmen who used powerful poisons to, po to 
paralyze their enemies or their prey. Now, it was reported that they barbecued their captives and washed them down with a little bit of cassava beer. I don't know if they drank the beer before or after the barbecue, but nonetheless, that was what was reported. In the history of the Barbados, uh, it is known that the Carib once ate an entire French ship's crew in 1596. Oh, look at them. Now, who out there doesn't like a little French food? <laughs> the Carib had canoes that were very similar to the Arawak. Now, shown here are some modern-day Carib uh, still making canoes the way their ancestors did. Basically, they would get a log, they'd start to cut it out, and then they would start to burn out the rest of the hull. Uh, theirs was pretty much a male-dominated society. Much of their life revolved around the sea. The men fished while the cultivation was a task for the women. Uh, the women also had to take care of the children and the housekeeping duties and stuff like that, while the men probably set up the barbecue and had the cassava beer. By the time Columbus arrived, the Carib had made their way up the Lesser Antilles, and it was pretty much the same route that their Arawak predecessors had taken. Very few of their descendants still live today, but they're on a reservation on the island in Dominica. Arawak and Carib cultures gave the English language many words that we frequently use to this day. Now, the next time you order an avocado or have a barbecue, remember the people who gave us these words. They also gave us food such as peanuts, pineapples, pumpkins, and potatoes. Of note are the cashews, the tomatoes, and tobacco that the native tribes cultivated. Their crops, as John said the other day, spread around the world. So what happened to all these people? Where'd they go? Well, Christopher Columbus convinced the king and queen of Spain to fund a voyage to find the route to the Orient. On his 1492 voyage, he landed in the Bahamas. The so-called great navigator had a few flaws in his estimate of the size of the earth, and he believed that he had reached India. A legend, and I'm not sure it's ever written down, but legend has it, that's why he called the indigenous people Indians. The Caribbean islands became known as the West Indies. On that voyage, Columbus captured 25 natives and took them back to Spain. Sadly, though, only eight of them survived the trip. He displayed them to the Spanish crown along with some gold trinkets and parrots and some other exotic loot. Columbus persuaded the king and queen to fund more voyages. What happened is that led to an explosion in the exploration, conquest, and exploitation by Spanish conquistadors, and pretty soon they were followed by other European countries. To give you an idea of the impact, archaeologists estimate that there were as many as 250,000 natives on the Caribbean islands when Columbus first arrived. By 1700, that number had dropped to less than 10,000. Most of the people perished because of diseases brought by the foreigners. Now it's time to sail on to Fort de France, Martinique. Martinique is only the third largest island in the Lesser Antilles. It stretches about 70 kilometers, that's 43 miles in length, and it's about 19 miles wide. This volcanic island lies along the subduction fault uh, where the North American plate is actually slipping beneath the Caribbean plate. Martinique as an island has eight volcanoes that date to about 24 million years ago. Uh, Mount Pele, surprisingly uh, named after the Hawaiian goddess of fire, Pele, uh, it was formed some 400,000 years ago. Now the natives, by the way, didn't name that mountain Mount Pele. It was the French much later on that made that name. Anyway, the highest point on the island is that mountain, and it's about 1,400 meters or some 4,500 feet high. Uh, the cone is composed of layers of volcanic ash and hardened lava. Pele is a stratovolcano, and you can tell it's a stratovolcano because of its tall cone shape. It's a very similar to Mount St. Helens, what she used to look like anyway. Uh, Mount Fuji, and the other great uh, stratovolcanoes in the world. They come about because of explosive pyroclastic action, where the shield volcanoes, like we saw in Sao Tome, have very loose, runny lava, so they tend to be much lower and with very gentle slopes. 
Martinique was originally inhabited by Arawak natives that had come up from South America. A majority of those early people were killed by an eruption of Mount Pele back in 295 AD. Over a hundred years later, the Arawak finally returned to the island. Uh, they renamed Martinique after, in their term after a mythical island. Uh, then sometime around 600 AD, the cannibalistic Carib arrived. They uh, exterminated the Arawak, uh, and they permanently settled on the island. The Carib referred to Martinique as the island of the iguanas. And yes, there are a lot of these little critters running around there. Later, the name was changed to Mandanina, uh, the island of flowers. Columbus rechristened the island Martinica because that's what he understood the natives to be saying when they were saying Mandanina. Uh, Columbus saw Martinique in 1493 when he first came around the area, but he did not set foot on the island. Uh, he didn't go on the island until 1502, and that was during his fourth and final voyage to the New World. The Spanish, when they got here, they looked around and they didn't really see anything of value. So they just sailed on for golder or greener pastures. The early tribes were displaced, exterminated, or assimilated after the Europeans arrived. Newcomers built plantations and brought in slaves to work the fields. Most of Martinique's Creole population today is descended from Africans, not from Native Americans. The rest of the island's population have mixed French, Lebanese, and Chinese ancestry. Modern Martinique was founded in 1635. The French governor at the time was driven off of a neighboring island of St. Kitts, uh, but he wasn't, didn't come alone. He brought with him about 100 loyal followers. Uh, they landed at the harbor that today is St. Pierre, and they were met there by some hostile natives, the Carib. They rose against the settlers and tried to drive them off of the island unsuccessfully, and that was the first of many skirmishes that would ensue. The Carib revolted against the French rule again in about 1658. This time the governor had the strength to do it, and he retaliated, and many of the natives were killed. All of those who survived were taken captive, and they were expelled from the island. Uh, at the time, Martinique's population numbered about 700, so the population, after they got rid of the natives, uh, dropped a little bit. The settlers cleared the land around St. Pierre to grow crops, and they planted indigo, tobacco, and later cacao and cotton. Now, the cacao and cotton primarily was for export. They grew manioc pota and potatoes for their own consumption on the island. Uh, manioc, as many of you know, is also known as cassava or arrowroot, and even some cases tapioca. It's the third largest source of food carbohydrate in the tropics, after rice and maize. Now, cassava is also a major staple food in the developing world, so we've seen it as we've been going around a lot of the third world countries in West Africa. Uh, now, there's a little bit of a catch, though, because improper preparation of cassava can leave enough residual cyanide. Now, there's a thing you want to have in your food, some cyanide to actually cause cyanide intoxication. That's probably not as comfortable as a little wine or alcohol intoxication, so I would recommend that you make sure you know how to handle your cassava. French and foreign merchants came to the island to buy almost all of the products that the islanders were willing to sell, and pretty soon Martinique was transformed into a modestly prosperous country. Back in 1638, Fort, Fran uh, Fort de France uh, had a stronghold built that was just for the protection of the island and the city. Fort St. Louis was constructed to protect the city against enemy attacks and the ever-present Caribbean pirates. This garrison was designed by the military architect Sebastian de Vauban. Vauban was the foremost military uh, engineer of his age. Uh, when he was just 10 years old, he was orphaned and placed in a Carmelite nunnery. At the age of 17, he was offered an officer's commission in the French army, but he declined because of his extreme poverty. Vauban's claim to fame was his skill in designing defenses in a star shape so that an enemy just couldn't sneak up on the fort. 
You could see them coming from any side. Now, many of the earliest French settlers in Martinique were Huguenots. Uh, they were seeking uh, some greater religious freedom than what they could experience in mainland France. Uh, edicts that had come from King Louis XIV's court regularly came to the island. You know, the king would write something out and he'd put it in the mail and send it to the island, and then three or four months later the mail would arrive. Uh, the idea, from, as far as the king was concerned, was to suppress the Protestant heretics. Um, but they were mostly ignored by the people out on the islands because most of the people on the islands were Huguenots. They were considered heretics anyway. Anyway, then Louis finally decided, I'm going to uh, issue the Edict of Revocation. That happened in about 1685. Uh, 95 years before that, there was a declaration that basically said that people could practice the religion of their choice without persecution. But Louis decided, no, 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 I'm not going to allow that anymore. So he revo revoked that privilege. For two years, the French crown decided, well, let's see, uh, what are we going to do with Martinique? Oh, I know what we're going to do with Martinique. We're going to use it as a dumping ground for the Huguenots. Or maybe we just use it as a threat to send them there, kind of like the English sent people to North America as well as to Australia. Well, the French thought that Martinique was going to be kind of the same thing. And over a 1,000 Huguenots were transported to Martinique during that period, usually under very miserable and crowded ship conditions, and many of them uh, died because of the uh, conditions they experienced en route. Those that did survive the trip were sold to plantation owners as indentured servants. Many of those planters on Martinique were themselves Huguenots, so they began to plot to leave Martinique with their recently arrived brethren. <laughs> no, I like this. They were encouraged by their Catholic neighbors to go ahead and move because the Catholic neighbors were looking forward to the departure of those heretics and also... They wanted to seize the property for themselves. Hey, it works for me. I, maybe I'll get our neighbors to move. By 1688, nearly all of the Martinique's uh, French Protestant population had escaped, either going off to the British American colonies or to Protestant countries back in, in Europe. Uh, that devastated the population of Martinique for a while, as well as the rest of the French Antilles. Martinique was then occupied several times by the British. I mean, it, all these islands moved between crowns for several years. Uh, it was traded back to France at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, and Martinique has pretty much remained as a French territory or a, a collective since that time. Before 1902, Saint-Pierre was the most important city in Martinique. While Fort de France was the official administrative capital, Saint-Pierre was the cultural capital of the island. It was known as the Paris of the Caribbean. I mean, we had several Parises, but this is the first one we talked about in the Caribbean. Now, the quiet was interrupted when Mount Pele decided to erupt. It completely destroyed Saint-Pierre, and 30,000 people were killed almost instantly. The only survivor in town was saved because of the thick walls, very thick walls, around his prison cell. I guess there is some good to be said if you get locked away. Uh, shortly after that eruption, the capital moved to Fort de France, and that stayed there ever since. Today, the inhabitants of Martinique are French citizens, and they have full political and legal rights. The official language is French, though many speak Creole. Creole language is based on French, Carib, and African languages. Uh, but sometimes it, when you hear them talking, you can pick up on little elements of English or Spanish and even Portuguese. On the island, the use of Creole is becoming more and more popular. It seems to be a way to redeem national identity and to prevent their culture, to be, uh, culture being assimilated by mainland France. People leaving the islands was reached its highest point. People just didn't want to stay on the islands in about 1970. And at that time, Martinique's growth, growth came almost to a standstill because so many people were leaving. But today, Martinique has a population of about 400,000 people. 
There's also, just to give you an idea how many people left, some 260,000 people with Martinique origins that live in mainland France. Tourism here has become more important than agricultural exports as a source of foreign exchange. Back in 2000, Martinique hosted some 500,000 tourists and it has grown at a pretty remarkable rate every year since. Today, the tourist industry employs about 7% of the total workforce on the island. And also, they trade, they use euros. So uh, they will accept dollars, I think, in a lot of the shops, but uh, they, their primary currency is the euro. There are some pretty expensive things here, though. I mean, not expensive because they're designer, but expensive because all goods that enter Martinique are charged what's called a variable sea toll. Now, that could be as high as 30% of the value of whatever the item is. So if it's a, a T-shirt, for example, that you uh, could get in the States for $3, here it might be 4 or $5 simply because of that sea toll. Uh, the sea toll does provide about 40% of the island's total revenue. Uh, also, the government charges a value-added tax, or a VAT. Uh, so they, they want to make sure they get the, the most dollars for the sale. Also, when you go out in town, uh, following traditional French customs, many of the businesses, small shops and so on, will close at midday, and they will stay closed for a moderately long lunch. And they usually will open again pretty late in the afternoon. Now, what are the tourists coming here to see and do? Well, the Musée uh, de la Pagerie doesn't have any tours in English. Everything there is in French but you can walk around on your own. Or if you read French, you could take somebody else from the ship and explain to them what's going on. Uh, it's a two-acre area that's a reconstructed slave village that's also a museum. Its origins uh, for the museum itself date back to 1929 when it was named for the La Pagerie family. Uh, they owned a sugar plantation on the site back in the uh, 1700s. Now, the daughter was named Marie-Joseph Rose Tacher de la Pagerie. Anybody know who she was? Yeah, I bet you do. She was married to Napoleon, and he called her Josephine. How she took that name and made it into Josephine, I don't know. Anyway, the little cottage that you see here was formerly the plantation's kitchen, and it's filled with a really wide assortment of Napoleonic-era art and artifacts. One of the most popular items is Josephine's childhood bed. Another big draw are uh, some Napoleons, I guess you'd call them sensual handwritten love letters to Josephine. To give you an idea how significant these things are, one of them recently sold at auction for a little more than $500,000. I bet old Napoleon would have loved to have that in his pocket. The Ans Cafard Slave Memorial consists of 20 white statues, and they face in the direction of the Gulf of Guinea, because that's where most of these people came from. The memorial commemorates an 1830 catastrophe when a slave ship crashed up onto the shore and sank. Many passengers and sailors were killed, and nearly all of the slaves, because the slaves were chained down in the cargo hold of the ship. Forty-six bodies were recovered while others were rescued and they were sheltered in local households. The colonial governor, government of Martinique was pretty much unsure what to do with these slaves because slavery had been abolished by France, by Britain, and other places, and these were kind of being smuggled in uh, sort of thing. So to solve his problem, he shipped the slaves off to a neighboring island. And as a result... They just kind of disappear from the official history of Martinique. Nobody really knows for sure because he didn't say what island he had sent them to. Another interesting place to visit on the island is the mineral-rich waters uh, that are thermal springs here on the island, and they've been used for centuries as an antidote to a whole bunch of different ailments. Uh, Fontaine Didier is a 100% naturally sparkling spring water and it's noted for being very rich in magnesium. Uh, Didier has been bottled and sold commercially here on the island since about 1930. 
It's used as a medicinal tonic, goes back a lot farther than that. The natives used it and the early people used it. And there are recorded incidents of the water from F uh, Fontaine Didier being used by the, the Europeans in the mid 19th century. And they were using it to treat liver disorders and rheumatism. At Fort de France, we also have a very unique opportunity to visit the Chateau de Paz estate. Uh, this is where they make the only rum in the world that's ever been presented, the French Appellation d'Origine Contrôlé label. Uh, that rewards the finest uh, wine, spirits, and cheeses uh, specifically identified to a location. Chateau de Paz Estate was, uh, uses a production method uh, for their rum that is the most expensive that is known anywhere in the world. The rum here is made from blue cane stock. That's a sugar stock, blue cane sugar. Uh, they have an extraordinarily high sugar level and a very f specific and unique flavor profile. Uh, many believe that's primarily due to the volcanic soils of Mount Pele and to the water on the island. To further intensify the natural flavors of the blue cane, only oak barrels are used uh, or are even permitted in the rum making process. The barrels are all small, they're not really big, they're charred oak casks, and according to the aficionados, they convey a barrel wood and mountain air aroma into the finished product. <sighs> it smells good to me. Now, in case you want to try that rum flavor with your morning pancakes, De Paz also produces a blue cane syrup. Uh, it's used to flavor things like rum cocktails as well as in dessert recipes or just spread it on your blueberry pancakes. Now, it's not sticky or sugary, kind of like corn syrup, but it's very thick-bodied, uh, kind of like molasses, and it has notes of cane and wood and toffee that are mingled with the real cane sugar's sweetness. Ah, now doesn't that make you think I'm a connoisseur of fine syrups? In my past, I might have been. Anyway, that's it for today, and we'll meet out in Baristas. I know there's some folks that are going to stay here for trivia, but I'm going to meet people out in Baristas. We can talk about the Caribbean. We can talk about Martinique or anything else you want to talk about about the ship, either there or any time you meet us out and about. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening. Merry Christmas. Ho, ho, ho.